We are going to close out our series this morning, and the concept of living ready tends to look into the future, have a perspective out into the future, but the reality of being ready has a lot more to do with the present. It has a lot more to do with what am I doing today to prepare myself for what is to come. You think about it in so many different arenas. You think about financially. You know, for those of you who are homeowners, your preparation for the water heater going is what you do today. A lot of times we live with this mindset of, well, I'll worry about that when I get there, or we'll cross that bridge when I get there, but sometimes that's too late. When we wait till that point, it's a little too late. We see it in so many different places. So years ago, I read a book by uh, a man named Bob Rotella. It's called How Champions Think, and in it, he talks about musicians and athletes and different people, how their desire and practice was so that they worked hard enough that once they got into the actual thing they were going to do, they didn't think about it. It was muscle memory. It was reaction. They just did it. So for a golfer, they wanted to practice every little component of swinging the golf club when they were away from the weekend tournament. Once they got to the weekend tournament, they didn't want to think about every little thing. They just wanted to swing the club. I've read something about musicians, the difference between somebody who's a professional musician and somebody who's just really talented as a musician is just hours invested. The amount of time that they put in in the moment prepares them for basically responding as they want to respond later. So when I was younger, I was really big into, I don't know if you ever watched the strongman competitions, the guys that throw big boulders and do crazy stuff, carry refrigerators. I just really enjoyed the strongman competition. And there's a guy who's a strongman competitor. His name is Eddie Hall. And there are a lot of debates out there of what the maximum deadlift is. So basically, that's just picking something up off the ground. My brother always makes fun of me when I lift weights. He's like, oh, you're picking stuff up and putting it back down. Like, yeah, doing a lot of that this morning. But the the record is somewhere over 1,000 pounds. So there are multiple men who have picked up over half of a ton, just picked it up and put it down. And Eddie Hall is one of those guys who set one of those records. And I was watching a, a series on Eddie Hall because a lot of the guys that Eddie would compete against, they were 6'5", 6'10". Eddie Hall was about 5'8", 5'11". So the girth that he needed to have to compete was pretty large. So Eddie would eat anywhere from 15 to 20,000 calories a day. His breakfast was 3,700 calories. Now, the average person is supposed to eat 2,000 calories a day. Eddie Hall, every day, leading up to his competition, for months, for years, ate 15,000 to 20,000. It was to the point of watching him eat his daily routine, and it hurt me to watch him do it. It was to a point where he didn't even like eating anymore. He, w- he had to wake up in the middle of the night to take in more calories. That's how much he was prepping. But all of that work was to prepare him to do something later. And the same is true in our spiritual lives. The same is true for us in our walk with the Lord, that if we're going to be prepared for what is to come, what we do today matters. And we find in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a pattern that reveals the same truth. So we've been digging through the gospel of Luke. Luke sought to write an orderly account of Jesus. And in the context where we are now, Jesus is he's closing in on the cross. He's to the end of his ministry with the disciples, so he's prepping them for what is to come. And it's a hectic, very tense scenario. And we read this in the text. Luke writes, He went out and made his way as usual to the Mount of Olives, And the disciples followed him. Can we make that a little bigger? Because I don't want you to miss this. And he went out and he made his way as usual. Let's emphasize that even more. As usual. I don't want you to miss that. It was Jesus' pattern, his normal habits to go, even after a long day of draining ministry, of healing people and speaking and teaching, it was his pattern to go and be with his father at the end of the day. Luke actually recorded just a chapter before, 
He said this, during the day, he was teaching in the temple, but in the evening, he would go out and spend the night on what is called the Mount of Olives. It was his normal pattern to be in the presence of his father. Even as Judas, right before this moment, Judas is going to betray him, and he knows it. He had just told Peter, you're going to deny me. He knows it. He knows what's coming, and even though life is crazy and he knows what's ahead of him, he still carries out the habit of being in the presence of his father. What I come to recognize, I want to share with you this morning, is that our greatest preparation for the future comes from being in the presence of our father. The more I wrestled over that statement, the more I found it to be true. If you want to be prepared for what is ahead of you, it comes from being in the presence of your Heavenly Father. And even when life is chaotic, and you're not sure what is going to happen or what's in front of you, what we need more even in that moment is to be in the presence of our Father. We are more prepared to respond according to the will of God when we are in the presence of God seeking His will. When I was studying under, I was serving under a pastor years ago down in Florida, he, he made this statement. He said that a lot of times when we go in to study the Word, and I want to encourage you to dive into the Word. We've been talking about this as a staff. What, what are some of the components that helped us grow as disciples? Some of it is the teaching and preaching of the Word. Some of it is small groups, the small communities where we're connected. But it wasn't until each of us as individuals decided to study God's Word and be in His presence on our own that God really started to grow us in our walk with Him. So dive into the Word. But what he said is that a lot of times what we do is we, we, maybe if we study the Word as a habit or a pattern, we get up in the morning, we kind of just like plop it open and think that's the place that God has a Word for me today. So we read it, and what happens too often is like, well, that doesn't make any sense for what I'm going through because God doesn't work that way. What he argued is that it's like having a first aid kit. And every morning or every evening that I get into the Word of God and I spend in the presence of the Father, I'm putting something in the first aid kit. I may not need that first aid kit today, but you better believe when I need it, I want to find something in it. And so I dive into the text and I spend time in the presence of God because I want to fill that kit. I want to be ready for what is to come. Our greatest preparation is being in the, in the presence of of the Father. Spiritual preparation before a trial can often be more beneficial than asking for some sort of aid or deliverance from the trial itself. To prep us before we dive into it. So recently I went to see a sight and sound performance. If you don't know sight and sound, Sight and Sound is a big theater down in Lancaster. They put on biblical plays, plays that are based on biblical characters or biblical history. And I've been here almost 11 years, and I've never gone. I've heard about it, just never went. And I'm going to say something, and hopefully you're not offended by it, but I've often been very skeptical of Christian entertainment because in my experience, Christian entertainment has historically been mediocre. So don't be offended by that. But it's been historically mediocre. It's low budget. It's low effort. And so I was skeptical. And friends of mine, they went to see a sight and sound performance. And they were telling me about it. It's a performance on David. He's a, a, a king in the nation of Israel. They're telling me about it. And I think they could sense my skepticism. I think they could sense that I'm saying, like, oh, yeah, sounds great. Sounds like a lot of fun. So, and, and that's not my jam. To be honest, uh, musicals, plays, not necessarily my thing. So they said to me, they said, we are getting you tickets and you are going. So they did, and we did. And I have to tell you, I was absolutely wrong. It was top-notch, one of the best things I have ever seen. And I'm not too ashamed to say... I teared up six times by the end of it. It didn't matter if there were 20,000 people in that theater. I was the only person in the room weeping as literal snowflakes are falling into the room on my face, just weeping and thinking about God and what he's done in my life. It was the most, one of the most impactful things I've ever seen. But what struck me the most about it was the story of David, and I resonated with this reality of David, 
David learned and prepared for being a great leader by being in the presence of his father. For years, David spent in the wilderness alone with the sheep and his God who created a world that's much bigger than him. And in that time period, David learned that God was his shepherd. In that time period, he learned that God was his refuge. It was in that time period he learned that no matter how big the world is and how crazy the universe is, God cared for David personally. And that prepped him to be a great leader because leadership is lonely. Maybe you've learned that. Leadership can be very, very lonely. You spend your whole life as a father or a mother caring for other people. You begin questioning, well, who cares for me? And as I thought about that concept of the loneliness of leadership, I realized that great leaders go into the presence of their father. Great men like David, my Savior himself, in the loneliness of the moment, the greatest moment of loneliness in all of human history, when all of the world would abandon him, where he would cry out, not just hours later, my father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He still pursued the presence of his father. Because our greatest preparation for what is to come comes from being in the presence of our father. It's what Jesus modeled, and it's what he called his disciples to do as well. It says, when he reached the place, and notice again, the pattern. Not only did he go as usual, Luke records that the place was known. It was so consistent, they knew when, where, and, and how often he would go. When he reached the place, he told them, the disciples, pray that you may not fall into temptation. He tells them to do the same. Be in the presence of your, of, of your Father to prepare yourself for what is to come. What is the temptation? Now, I, I don't believe that I can answer that specifically, but context would lead me to believe that perhaps the temptation was to abandon their faith. Jesus had just said to Simon that Satan wanted to sift all of them, but I've prayed that your faith would not cease. Context would also lead me to believe that the temptation would be to trade God's will for their own. And isn't that the core of all temptation? Every temptation in my life is a, a a push or a pull. Here's, here's one. Every temptation we face involves a push or a pull to choose our will over the Father's or another will other than the will of God. That's what temptation is. Choose your will or somebody else's will over the Creator God's will. And they were about to face temptation. And what Jesus is calling them to is to be in the presence of their Father to prepare for temptation. Because I believe that even in, or maybe more so, in the heightened frustrations and stresses of life, that temptation is greater. Just, I, I want to speak to married men in the room. Think about it for a moment. When you are frustrated with your spouse... Watch how often you justify temptation or giving into it. Take note of it. Take note of those moments and how you might find inside of you this desire to justify a temptation, to give in to something that's other than the will of the Father. It's in this heated moment that Jesus says, pray so that you may not fall into temptation. It makes complete sense to me than in the heightened moments of stress and anxiety and fear that we need to be in the presence of the Father all the more. It says, then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. If you remember, and this has been quite some time since we started the Gospel of Luke, Luke, at the beginning of his Gospel, says that he set out to write an orderly account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. 
this tells me that Luke had some conversations with eyewitness people. The details that Luke gives that Jesus traveled about a stone's throw away, and the posture in which Jesus prayed, they noticed. And it was traditionally, the posture of a Jewish man was to stand to pray. Jesus knelt to pray, and I think within it is the weight of the moment that's on his shoulders. And in his prayer, he prays this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was confronted with the same thing every one of us is confronted with, the desire to trade God's will for our own. It was thousands of years before, in a garden alone, one man decided to trade God's will for his own. And here we find another man in a garden confronted with the same situation, Will I trade God's will for my own? Will I trade the will of the Father for my own? And we see the deep implications of what he's talking about in the phrase, take this cup from me. Now, we understand, and, and perhaps if you've grown up in the church, you have some historical understanding, we know the depth of what Jesus suffered physically. The suffering that Jesus endured, the, the, the structure of cru- the crucifixion and the structure of flogging, they were designed to create maximum discomfort. The Roman soldiers had developed a way of executing and punishing people that was designed to bring the maximum amount of pain. And Jesus himself was prepared physically to endure the highest amount of pain. Luke writes this, he says, being in anguish, he, Jesus, prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Many have argued that because Luke is the only one who records this concept, that he's just speaking a metaphor, because he uses the term like. His sweat, it was like drops of blood. My, My struggle with it is that Luke is very detailed, Luke is also a physician, so Luke understands and pays attention to what's occurring. And if he's just speaking a metaphor, why wouldn't he say he sw- his sweat was like drops of oil, or his sweat was like drops of mud? Why wouldn't he say anything else? Why would he specifically say blood? And we know many physicians have, have determined and shown that this is an actual occurrence, It's called hematidrosis. Now, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a medical physician. I'm reading this from something else. I don't even know if I said the word right. I'm not even pretending. But the concept of this this thing is that under deep anxiety, the capillaries in, in the sweat glands would break down, causing blood to go into the sweat. So when the sweat would come out of the body, it would be tinged with blood. What's even more important is that when that occurs, the skin of that individual is heightened in its sensitivity and fragility. So Jesus is physically prepped in a heightened sensitivity and fragile body to endure what he's about to endure. The weight of this moment, Jesus in anguish, sweat drops of blood, was a preparation for the physical agony that he was about to face. There's a great book by Lee Strobel. It's called The Case for Easter. It's super tiny, super easy to read. And in it, he he speaks with different uh, medical examiners, physicians, to try to understand what's actually going on here. And one of those physicians speaks about the Roman flogging, which occurred before the crucifixion for Jesus, and he says this. Roman floggings were known to be terribly brutal. They usually consist of 39 lashes, but frequently were a lot more than that, depending on the mood of the soldiers applying the blows. The soldier would use a whip of braided leather thongs with metal balls woven into them. 
When the whip would strike the flesh, these balls would cause deep bruises or contusions, which would break open with further blows. And the whip had pieces of sharp bones as well, which would cut the flesh severely. The back would be so shredded that part of the spine was sometimes exposed by the deep, deep cuts. The whipping would have gone all the way from the shoulders, down the back, the buttocks, and the back of the legs. As flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscle and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. A third century historian by the name of Eusebius described the flogging by saying the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. I can't even read it. And Jesus endured it. And that's before the cross. With a heightened physical sensitivity. And then Jesus was taken to the cross, and they drove nails in his wrists. The physician went on to explain if you ever notice when you hit your funny bone, what you're hitting is a nerve that's in the elbow and runs along the arm. In the wrist is a lar- the largest nerve that comes out of the hand. And it's not like hitting it when those nails drive through it. It's like taking a pair of pliers and wrenching it. But the goal of the cross was that through asphyxiation, through suffocation, the sufferer would die. And every time they would take a breath, they would have to push themselves up on the nail that's driven through their feet to just breathe again. It's why Jesus would know when he says, it is finished, and breathe his last. That's what Jesus physically endured. Yet that's not the cup that he's talking about. If that were not enough, that's not the cup that he's talking about. When he's in anguish in the garden praying that God the Father would take this cup, let it pass, it wasn't the physical thing that he would endure. It was the wrath of God that would be poured out on his shoulders. If you were to read through the Old Testament, you would find time and time again that the cup represented God's wrath. A couple examples, Isaiah says this, speaking on behalf of God, Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dread the goblet that makes people stagger. Jeremiah wrote this, said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom, to, to whom I send you drink it. The cup that Jesus was speaking about was the wrath of God for all of sin, for all of mankind that was about to be poured out on him. God is a holy and just God, and as a holy and just God, he cannot leave sin unpunished. But on the cross, God's wrath was spent, not withdrawn. A just God cannot say, it's done, I won't do anything about it. A just God must spend his wrath, and the Father spent his wrath, pouring it out on the Son, A lot of times the question may be asked, why did Jesus die? And many times our answer to that question is, because he loves. Which is not fully inaccurate, but it's incomplete. Because if if the answer is he loves, we have to ask ourselves then, why was his death needed to express his love? Why couldn't he express his love any other way? One of the close followers of Jesus named John wrote this, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for sins. That word atoning sacrifice in the original language is the same word that Paul used in another letter to the Romans. 
Paul wrote, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. That word atonement or sacrifice of atonement is what's often translated propitiation. It literally means appeasement or satisfaction. And what both John and Paul are saying is that Jesus' death was the satisfaction of the wrath of a righteous God. He satisfied, he appeased the justice and righteousness that God's wrath was poured out on him as a just God so that he can remain just and also through faith in Jesus be a justifier too at the same time. His grace, his love, and his justice are displayed at the same time in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the cup that Jesus is talking about. Charles Spurgeon once said this, I am never afraid of exaggeration when I speak of what my Lord endured. All hell was distilled into that cup of which our God and Savior Jesus Christ was made to drink. Jesus didn't withdraw the wrath that we deserved. He absorbed it. And even in his request that the Father would take away this cup, he says, not my will, but yours be done. And Luke writes, an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. The cup would not be removed, but he would be spiritually strengthened. Perhaps there are times in our lives where the Father may not spare us from what is to come. But he will give us the strength to face it. The cup may not be taken, but we will be divinely strengthened. But I consider this moment, and I recognize that in a garden at the beginning of mankind, one man said, not your will, God, but mine. And it utterly broke the world. For the rest of his life and the life of every man and woman who would follow him, they suffered by the sweat of their brow. Until thousands of years later, another man was in a garden and by the sweat of his brow said, not my will, but yours, Father. And he utterly shook all of mankind. Every day, we are confronted with the temptation to choose our will over the Father's. And what prepares us for those moments, what allows us to live ready, is being in the presence of the Father today. It's moment by moment being in the presence of our Father, seeking His face, seeking His will, it is there that we're prepared for what is to come. Your greatest preparation for the future comes from being in the presence of your Father. In the same context, Jesus would say to his disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If I'm going to overcome this flesh of mine that so often wants to follow the pattern of its father and say, not your will, God, mine, I must be in the presence of my father calling out for his spirit to strengthen where my flesh is weak. Living ready means more than anything presently pursuing our father. Let's make presence with our father the usual. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is hard for me to fathom just the physical pain that you endured for us. And in expressing your love, you also understood that you had to pay the penalty for sins. 
And when I consider the depth of your suffering, and when I consider the wrath, the cup that you drank of, what it challenges me in the times that I've taken my sin lightly. What it convicts me of the moments where I justified choosing my will over yours. Yet in your grace and in your love expressed, you chose the Father's will over your own. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And in that moment, you bought for us redemption. In that moment, you changed what the first man accomplished. Gave us the opportunity through faith in you to have freedom from that sin. And freedom from all the brokenness that it brings. Or too often I find myself in places that I'm not prepared for. And if I'm honest, it's because I haven't spent time in your presence. But I pray for those of us who believe in our Savior Jesus Christ that we would be in your presence daily seeking your face and seeking your will. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here today who this is the first time they're understanding what you accomplished, I pray that they would recognize that they are sinners and that their sin demands a punishment from a righteous and holy God, yet you poured out that that punishment upon your son Jesus Christ and that all of us through faith can now be redeemed we could be justified declared right in the presence of our father I pray that they would take that step of belief today and that when we do we would not continue to walk in a pattern of choosing our will over your, yours that we would follow your pattern and say your will not mine be done I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ